All right, well, as you're coming in on the table up here by the, by the doors, uh, there are handouts for both last week and this week. So if you were here last week and you didn't get handouts, and it's really going to bother you that you have weeks one, two, you skip week three, and then you get week four, I didn't want that to bother you all semester. So I put a, a week three handout for you with the slides that were on the screen. So now you have a placeholder so that everything stays in order, okay? Um, so you have the handout from last week on the table and the handout for this week. So make sure you get both so that your notebooks are complete. And we will get started here in just a couple of minutes. We won't delay too long because we've got a lot to do tonight. So just come on in, get your handouts. Make sure you sit at a table with a few other people, okay? No, no Lone Rangers here, all right? So make sure you got some other people at your table because there's going to be discussion. Uh, there's going to be interaction. Um, so, yeah, so if you don't do it now... When we get to the discussion time, you're probably going to have to do it then. So you, you pick your, your time to, to huddle up with other people. So, and either way is okay. We're not going to um, make you move, but just encourage it. All right. Well, let's go ahead. People can come on in and join us as they drop off kiddos and all the things. Let me start by introducing, if you do not know them, Rick and Sue Hugler. Oh, come on. You can, if you can I, you, make them feel, make them feel better than that. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Rick and Sue lead our marriage ministry here at FBC. They're also very involved in the San Antonio area uh, with marriage ministry. They are part of a team and a network uh, of, of people who have the passion they do just to invest in marriage. They believe God's word has so much to say about marriage and how we relate to each other within marriage. And so when we were preparing Family Matters, and I knew we were going to spend some weeks talking about marriage, I was, my first call was to say, Rick and Sue, can you help lead those weeks? And they were like, like if you've seen Sue sing on stage, like, you know, she, she kind of sings, but dances, right? It, it's, it's like three fourths dancing and, and one fourth singing maybe. Um, maybe I'm not sure the ratio, but, but there's, there's, um, she was that excited. Okay. That excited about talking about marriage. And so I am so excited for you guys to get to hear from them, learn from them for all of us to get to learn together, laugh together, um, and have some great conversation. Let me say it now in case we run short of time. Next week is Valentine's day. Don't use that as a chance to kind of not come, all right? Because it's going to be a special Family Matters Valentine's Day edition, okay? So be a cheap date night, guys, right? I mean, seven bucks for dinner, and that's all, right? I mean, it's $7 date night. Uh, the tables will be decorated. Well, and you get Rick and Sue. You get like dinner and a show uh, on on Valentine's Day. It's going to be great. Tables will be decorated. We're going to have a great time together. It'll be fun and and good. So make sure you come back out next week. But guys, can I pray and then turn it over to you guys? All right. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for this time that we have to get to continue God, just going to your word to help us understand, God, what it is, your design for our families, your design for our marriages, God, how you intended it for us to relate to our children and to parent. God, even just in general for relationships, period. God, you have so much to say. Your word does. The gospel has incredible implications for all of these matters that we will cover over these weeks. So God, would you speak to us tonight? God, I pray that we would be open to hear from you. Uh, and God, that this would be just a great time for us to kind of grow in these relationships. Be with Rick and Sue as they lead us in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, as Pastor Daniel said, we, we have been involved in a marriage ministry here at First Baptist Church since 2010. And that was all God ordained. We were at a house in Bernie at a social event and a couple were talking about this marriage mentoring. They had gone and received some training in Dallas and three couples kind of gravitated toward that discussion, the Weeks, the Hugglers and the Kittrells. 
And we said, yes, we'll go to that training. And that was the genesis of a marriage ministry here at First Baptist Church. And so God has blessed that. He has sharpened us in our marriage through that. So we're excited to be here tonight. You will see a lot of passion about marriage. We are passionate about marriage and God's design for marriage. And, and our hope and prayer is that our passion just rubs off on you, that it's infectious, not in a creepy COVID way, but just uh, it's a f infectious. And you guys really begin to see and walk away with God's design for marriage, because believe it or not, his word says a lot about marriage. We are blessed to have our pastors with us. Whoop. And I say that as a caveat, because you know what it's like to share God's word in front of two pastors? Ah, no it, pressure, it no takes, pressure. It takes faith in the Lord, right? It, let me just say that. And so when we say something and either Pastor Daniel or Pastor Jason stand up and say what Sue meant, meant to, to say, say. <laughs> okay, grant us grace, right? Grant us grace as we talk about marriage. Okay, so in your packet, on the first page of your packet, is this little thing called a marriage quiz. Oh, yes. You quiz did not time. guess that you were going to get a quiz marriage time. quiz right up front. We're getting you involved early. Yes, we want those brains engaged. And here's what we hope you take away, by the way, uh, when we finally, six lessons from now, go over this quiz. So you're going to have this with you each six weeks, and hopefully you'll go through and go, oop, got that one wrong, and, and you'll make some corrections. But this quiz will demonstrate to you that the world impact on us, even in the church, secular thinking creeps into our marriage, and we start thinking wrongly about our marriage. We start thinking in secular terms and not biblical terms. And we'll point that out. And, and, and if I'm wrong, you tell me when you leave today, hey, did something creep into my marriage that is not biblical? So over the next So go six ahead and, weeks, and do that. I'm yes, sorry. Go ahead and start ahead and that. Start, but over the next six weeks, we're going to be addressing common struggles that we all face in our marriage. This evening, we're starting with, like my husband said, we are beginning with what does God say? And how have we been influenced by the worldview? How have we allowed that to affect our thinking about marriage? Next week, even though it's Valentine's, we're going to be talking about communication and how to fight fair. Because I'm not saying we can avoid conflict. We all struggle but how do you do it in a God-honoring way? It is a lifelong journey, I'll be honest about that, right? And then we're going to move on. We're going to talk about God's uh, design of marriage, the role of a husband, the role of a wife. How are these roles? Proverbs 31 has always been tough for me. It's a lifelong journey, yes? But we'll talk roles. And then we need to have honest conversations about the struggles we all face. Pastor Daniel and Pastor Jason are bringing a panel of people after that to talk honestly about divorce and how that tough topic and how difficult that is, right? What we go through and how do we come alongside to offer our love, our support, still our honoring guidance. our Lord and our guidance as they go through the midst of struggle. And then after that, we will wrap up the very last week. There's a break for spring break where we will not meet, but we will meet up to affirm one another, to remind ourselves what we've learned over the past six weeks and to just affirm each other and our marriage. Does that sound good as you're working on your quiz? So let's get started with tonight. And right up front, we want to talk about marriage myths and truths. Because again, pop culture, the media, social media, um, we're, we're inundated. Big tech, we're inundated by secular thinking in our marriage. And so we want to, right up front, hit you with some marriage myths and some of those truths. But and then we're also going to talk about covenant and contract. Yes. Tell you, when you're in marriage, you gotta laugh. There has to be humor. So we are inserting humor in our marriage. Who knew Sinbad knew a lot about marriage? Here we go. Daniel, I may need help 
to start it. How does it start? It's it's embedded, yeah. right? Ah. Uh, we had it set up much easier. Wow, that's hard. Ah, there you go. Ah, there we there it is. Okay, perfect. You the man. Okay, humor people. Sinbad. Sinbad's gonna tell us about marriage. Marriage is work. Marriage is a career. It's not an adventure. You do more before five than most folks do all day. It's like the military. My wife and I, we're together about six, seven years. We're married. We divorced for 10, 11 years. Now we're back together, married eight years. Because we're both so damaged, we can't be with nobody else. We had to come back home. Once you've been married to each other, you're trained. I'm trained. I ain't got time to train nobody else. She ain't got time to train nobody else. Everybody's jacked up. Go back to the one you had. I thought you was crazy. Everybody crazy. I know you're crazy. I can deal with your crazy. And all you men out here, 55 years old, trying to date some girl 20 like she like you. Are you out your mind? She wants your house. I don't see no 20 year old girls with a broke down 55 year old man with no money. You don't see no girl 20. Oh, he's, look at the homeless dude, but he's cute. Hey, hey. She wants you to die. <laughs> if you keep messing with her, you will. You want a woman that understands the signs of stroke. That's what I'm looking for. A woman that got my medication in her purse. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. I thought you took it. I thought I did. You want a woman that's your nurse. See, if you go to dinner with a woman that's 55 years old and you, your little lip curl up, she know what to do. Hey, 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 Jamal, Jamal, look at me. Jamal, look at me. She'll get you to a hospital and save your life. For the girl 20, quit making faces at me. It's not funny anymore. <laughs> now you all stroked out for the rest of your life because your little cute girlfriend didn't know the signs of stroke. She come visit you in the hospital. I ain't know where the stroke was. I tried to tell her. I don't understand you. I had a stroke. <laughs> well, can I have your house now? <laughs> Since you can't live there no more. Marriage is about growing old together. Marriage is about falling apart at the same time. That's what makes it special. You live long enough, the two of you become one good person. You become one. That's biblical. One Bib can see, one can hear. One can walk, one can use their hand. You need each other. You have to go to movies together. One listens, one watches. You become a team. One got a good right hip, one got a good left hip, and you're balanced. They're so cute together. No, they fall down. They need one another. Gotta love Sinbad. And who knew that Sinbad had a biblical principle in there? The two become one. And we'll talk about that. But before we do that, we have three questions that we want to ask you. And these aren't rhetorical questions, so we want responses. And the first one of those is, what is the purpose of marriage? Now, if you're in our growth group, you cannot answer this question. But what is the purpose of marriage? Just shout out. Shout it out. I'll, I'll help. How about to have kids? Procreation. Procreation. Good one. Oh, Go ahead. One Come on. Here. Life partner. Life partner. Yes. Right. Companionship. Right. How about sex? Yeah, sex. Yes. Yeah, sex yes. is a good reason, right? That's good. Right? Joint checking. How about joint checking? Financial stability. Okay. Financial stability. These are all purposes, yeah, but I don't know if it's a, the purpose. Sanctification. Sanctification. Right. Okay. Yeah. We have a ringer in the audience. This is folks. clearly a very bright group of people. 
Excellent. Okay, okay. next okay. question. That was good. Next question. What is the greatest threat to marriage today? The greatest threat. What? Money. 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 Okay, good. Money. Self. Oh, ooh, we have some very <laughs> cowboy. cowboy fans. I don't yes. Know if I can write that one down. But but yes. Technology. Technology. Yeah, these are all great answers. Yes. Pornography. How about Adultery. How about busyness. We all get so busy. Great right? threats. But we'll tell you what the single greatest threat. All right, last one then. We got those two out of the way. Now the last one. What is success? What what defines success in marriage? Selflessness. Selflessness. Thank you. So that goes in right in hand with sanctification. Pardon me? Peace, joy, and love. Is that what I heard? Okay. Lovely, yes. Okay, we'll put that under communication. Selfless communication. Finding my soulmate. Jesus. Good listening. If you ever do love and respect, I just have to insert this. At love and respect, Emerson talks that about a little boy, and there was family time in front of the pastor, and the pastor was like, uh, I want to talk to you. What is it that collects nuts, has a long, bushy tail, and runs up a tree? And the little boy says, Pastor, I know the answer must be Jesus, but it sounds, sounds like, like a squirrel, squirrel to me. Right. So we've been trained. But in truth, Sounds like Jesus, a squirrel. Right? In truth, Jesus. Okay, those were good answers, and we'll get back to those. We'll circle back around. But in the meantime, let's get into those myths and truths. And the first myth we want to talk about is God just wants me to be happy. And we hear this all the time. How many have heard that? How many have said that, God maybe? God just wants me to be happy. God just wants me to be when happy. When we use the word myth, think of the Think of world view. Yes, okay. yes. Think and of so, world view. So what is happiness? Happiness is emotion that's based on circumstances. And in, in, in our lifetime, in, during our life, week from week, month to month, how are our circumstances? They're up, they're down, they're up, they're down. So if we are pinning our marital success on happiness, what does our marriage look like? Up, down, up. Down. Welcome to the roller coaster of marriage if happiness is your yardstick for your marriage. Happiness is an emotion. God has blessed us with many emotions, but our marriage that he designed is not based on emotion. So what's the truth to this myth? Truth is God designed marriage to refine us. It is God's greatest sanctification tool. We heard that tonight, sanctification. And marriage is one of his greatest sanctification tools. There's an author, Gary Thomas, wrote Sacred Marriage. Our marriage and family growth group at 9 o'clock is going through that now. Gary Thomas says, what if God didn't design marriage to make us happy, but to make us holy? Totally different perspective, right? Not a worldly perspective, but a biblical perspective. All right. Moving on, yes. myth number two. If I'm unhappy, I must have married or found the wrong person. Ooh. Ladies, I fell for this hook, line, and sinker. What? I loved the movie Cinderella. I've seen every version known to man. It's true. And I was confident that out of the eight billion people in this world, I was going to find my soulmate my Prince Charming, and we would ride off into the sunset and live. Everyone knows. Yep. And the movie ends. And then rose-colored glasses come off after a couple of months. And I, in my desire to please my guy, I did marry Prince Charming, right? It's true. I have to say that as, as we refine each other. 20 bucks. But after a couple months, and I started doing laundry, his socks smell different than mine. Just saying. Better. There's towels on the floor. Just saying. And we started doing things like squeezing toothpaste in the middle <gasps> instead of at the end is a world problem, okay? <laughs> That's what happens. And so I started to question. I'm being honest and candid as we insert humor. 
have I married the wrong person? And I fell for that. Now, what is God's truth? The truth is, people, it ain't about me. It is about my God. And it is about being refined as was brought out, this journey of sanctification and my personal relationship with my Lord and Savior. And it's not about finding the right person. It is about becoming the right person. That makes sense? Next one. Oh, you guys will love this one. Why does my spouse make me so angry? Anybody ever say that in their marriage? Yes, yes. Why does my spouse make me so angry? Newsflash, your spouse cannot make you angry, okay? Blaming our spouses for our behavior is as old as Adam and Eve. When Eve sinned and Adam partook and God came looking for Adam, what did he say when God found him? Yes, the woman you gave me caused me to sin. Blame two people in one sentence. That's pretty impressive. And we've been doing that in marriage ever since, right? We blame our spouses for our bad behavior. What's the truth? Blaming is easy. Ownership is very difficult because what does ownership do? Ownership forces us to look at ourselves and to take accountability for our behavior. Uh, How we respond to our spouse in our marriage is a direct reflection, by the way, of our vertical relationship. So this horizontal relationship is a reflection of this. Very important that we walk away. My response in my marriage is 100% my responsibility. So how do we know this? Yes. I saw some faces out there. Yeah. Okay? You don't know my one. Like, yeah, you don't know. You, you don't, don't know, know my, my husband. Wife. They make me angry. So again, giving credit to love and respect, we're going to, I'm sitting so y'all can see me. If I stood up, I would disappear behind the counter. So I'm sitting here. I said that on behalf of Pink's <laughs> pastor, so he won't say it first. So we are going to demonstrate how we know this to be true. Remember when I shared about how I said scathing things in front of the pastor if you were at that sermon? Uh, Slam the door. Slam the door. Wish you would give me as much. Yes, it, it was sad. So imagine we are in a bit of a heated discussion, okay? And I'll move the mic away because we tend to yell. It's like, I am sick and tired No, no. always leaving you your stuff. You always right say that. You, you never, never give me the benefit of the doubt. You always you assume the word. Bring, bring, bring. Old time phone. Old time, Old time phone. phone. Princess phone. He- Hello? <gasps> Pastor Daniel. <laughs> wow. Hi, Pastor Daniel. Hi. Hey. Hi. Hey, Hi. Pastor. Pastor Daniel on yeah. the phone. What? You're going to have Wednesday nights and you want us to talk about marriage? Babe, Glad to. to talk we're, about in. We're, we're in. We're in, babe. In. We're in. We're in. Right? We're in. Okay, we'll get together to work it out. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Click. And, and furthermore, furthermore, I am sick. I am not putting up with this anymore. We're not out of control. How does that happen? Right? Can we're we not be a- honest and say, does this happen in the room? Do I get to raise my hand to relate? Yeah, a lot of people are like, yes. Are they? Have they been in my home? No. Yeah. You've been to our house, right? You've heard. So. Granted, our response and our relationship with our Lord is our Our responsibility. responsibility. Okay? Number four. Number four, I am not getting what I expected out of my marriage. Hmm. You all, let's face it. We all come into marriage with expectations. Some we communicate. Some we may not even understand. Some of us bring for lack of a better word, we bring baggage into our marriage. We have past wounds, hurts, maybe things that have never healed. And so it affects our ability to trust, right? Our ability to openly communicate. Do you know, I actually believed that if my husband really loved me, this is true. He would know what I wanted without having to ask me. 
Do I hear you like, yes? You would know where I'd want to eat, right? You would know by my expression. Yes, obviously, I married Superman, and he can read minds, right? So I fell into this issue of expectation, and we didn't ever talk about it early in our marriage, and that caused a lot of stress. So what's the truth here? But the truth is an issue of not what I get out of my marriage. It is an issue of what do I get? We have a consumer culture, and it's all about what am I getting, and we want it now. And what am I getting? Think about a marriage where you have two, two people in a marriage, and they're both wondering, what can I give in my marriage? That is foundational for a prosperous marriage. Okay, moving on. There's more. We've got a ton of them. Wait, there's more. Here's another one. I love this one. Our love. This is Hollywood, right? This is every chick flick you've ever watched. Our love will overcome everything. Sounds good, right? Our love will overcome everything. Here's the problem. That if that said, our unconditional love will overcome everything, that would be a true statement. That's what God intends for our marriage, for us to develop agape love, the love that Christ showed us on the cross, that selfless, sacrificial love. That's the kind of love in a marriage that will overcome everything. But we don't enter marriage with agape love. That takes a while. We enter marriage with erotic love and friendship love. And it takes a while to develop that agape love. So that is a myth when we talk about our love. When we come into marriage with those rose-colored glasses saying, our love will overcome everything. Then the last, not, not the last one. Oh, and Pastor Daniel talked about this on the 14th of January when he kicked off uh, the, the sermon ser series uh, there is a crisis in marriage today. We hear that all the time. We hear that all the time. There's a crisis in marriage. Marriage is in crisis. Here's the truth. There is no crisis in marriage. Marriage is exactly as God designed it 4,000 years ago. No change, no difference. What's changed is us, our belief system, our theology. Our theology has followed the way of the world and we start believing untruths. We don't know God's word about marriage, and therefore we don't follow it in our marriage. There's not a crisis in marriage. It's just as it was God designed it, and it's amazing. And the last one, it refers to an earlier one. God wouldn't want me to stay in an unhappy marriage. Oof. I, too, went through struggles, right, in our marriage after 40 years. I was a child bride, by the way, just child bride. Yeah. But 40 years, and I went through struggles and periods of unhappiness. And we talked about unhappiness is an emotion. The challenge with this is that type of thinking is temporary thinking. It is a period of time, but when God designed marriage... He made it, which we're going to be talking about here quickly, he made it in the form of a covenant, a permanent, long-lasting commitment between you, your spouse, and your Lord. Amen. And we'll talk about that. It is not a contract. Yes. If, we, if you have this thought in the back of your mind, God wouldn't want me to stay in an unhappy marriage, you are thinking secularly. You are thinking contractually about your marriage. And there's one more, by the way. I, it's not on the slide. I'll throw this in as a freebie. Who remembers the, the movie Jerry Maguire? It's kind of old. I know. There's a couple, there's a couple old timers in here. All right. No one wants to raise their hand because they're like, oh, I don't know. Um, so there's a key, key line in the end of that movie. Anybody know what that line is? You complete me. And, you know, and we all swoon at that, and it's amazing. Here's the truth to that statement. Your spouse will not complete you. Your spouse will complicate you. Jesus Christ will complete you, right? Perhaps you didn't hear him 
accuse me of complicating his <laughs> life. Perhaps you didn't hear that, but yes, he said it out loud. No, you, yes, and so, <laughs> <laughs> moving right along. Moving right along, but you get. Is it warm in here? You get the point. Uh, and you have a beautiful line about do not look to creation. Yes, do that. not look to creation, what you can only find in the creator, right? And that's what we do and that's when what we say you complete by me. our Lord is who we should seek for completeness. Amen. All right. So what you see on this screen is all of the myths. Is there something that stands out to you? Have you all been to Is there a notes? common theme here? Why does my spouse make me so angry? I'm not getting what I, I expected want out of marriage. I'm like, not speak happy. It, you're, speak it boldly, man. You got it. Selfish. Right? Yeah, it's all but about it's me, me, baby. It's all right? about me. And that is what we think. Do you think that's how God designed marriage? Just it's all about me? Just the opposite. Now I secretly, of course it's about me. Yeah. No. That's God's the worldview. God's truth is what you read here on the screen. Our marriage should be a reflection of our relationship with God. It should be our testimony that points the world towards Christ. Amen? Amen. Okay. All right. So let's circle back and answer those questions. Yeah. That, stop, okay. Stop, Why do we get married? That quiz we gave you, we gave some answers. Out yeah, there's some, qu there's some answers coming out here. There's some answers. So why do we get married? What's the purpose of marriage? We heard it. We heard it. We heard be bold. It be be strong. Be bold. Reflect, ooh, you look reflect good. God's love. Reflect God's love. It is sanctification. It is God's greatest sanctification tool. All right. It's as if God puts us in this crucible, turns up the heat, right, and all the impurities, sin, come to the top, and and He disposes of those if we are the dross. If we confess and repent. And then he looks in this crucible. What does he see? His reflection, right? Isn't that a beautiful picture of marriage? God turns up the heat and, and, and lets us see where we fall short of his glory. And if we're obedient like King David, Lord, search my heart. Show me where I've fallen short. Then he clears that away and we, he sees his his image. I love that. Our class has heard this, so my husband shares that as we share uh, what, how God designed marriage. And uh, I talk to my husband and go, you prayed for patience, didn't you? Because God brought me to you, and I have been testing your patience Amen, every sister. day. Amen. It's my job as your wife. Amen. I'm working on that. Okay, number two, what's the greatest threat to marriage? Self. Sin. Sin. Sin is the number yeah. one, right? Said. My sin. And that's what God uses marriage to do, to show us. We're very, I'm very good at pointing out my wife's sin. And I can use the <laughs> elbow as better than anybody. But God wants us to look inward, right? Like King David. Sin is the greatest threat to marriage today. And then what is the success, success in marriage today? If you know number one and number two, number three is easy. Just apply what you, what you know about the purpose of marriage. If it's sanctification, then you allow God through the Holy Spirit to sanctify you and draw you closer to him. God says, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. Okay, in our remaining time before we go to discussion, we want to take time to talk about a covenant foundation. Ah, uh, so what is a covenant Again, not a rhetorical question. What's a covenant? A promise. I hear okay. that. Promise? Yes. Promise. What else? I'm sorry? Commitment. Commitment. Thank you. Yes. Okay. A, a covenant is a binding agreement. And when we talk covenant, generally God is the holder of the covenant. We have a new covenant in Jesus Christ, and God is the holder of that covenant. OK, in, in ancient times, when two people entered a covenant, they would actually butcher an animal, cut the animal in half, put the two sides down and 
the, the parties going through the covenant would walk through between those two pieces of animal, recite the terms of the covenant, and when they were done, they would say, and do unto us what we've done to this animal if we violate the terms of this covenant. You think covenant's a pretty serious business with God? Absolutely. And he intends marriage to be a covenant relationship. You have a handout that identifies just a few verses that show how God sees us in terms of marriage. Yes. And what I love about this is these are Old Testament verses, New Testament verses. So throughout the Bible, God talks about us in marriage terms. So look at some of these. Your builder will marry you as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. Uh, sent her away because of his adulteries. Com God was always on Israel about committing adultery. That's a marriage term. You will, be call, you will call me my husband and no longer my master. I will betroth you to me forever. The time will come when the bridegroom will take a, uh, be taken from them. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. And then Ephesians 5, 31, 32, amazing verses. He, he quotes um, Genesis, Genesis 2, 24. Father will, uh, father we'll will leave, yeah, a man will leave his father and mother, be united with his wife, and they become one flesh. And look what he says. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. So somehow this marriage is a reflection of the marriage of Christ and the church. And then in, in Revelation 19, 7, we have the culmination of all that. For the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. God talks about marriage throughout the Bible and he talks about us in marital terms. He loves this thing called marriage. I wanna spend some, we both wanna spend some time about this verse, Genesis. 224. Love it. It is a beautiful verse that we refer to frequently as we look at what God has to say about marriage. First and foremost, let me hear it from you. Do you believe God designed marriage? Not a trick question. Yes. Yes. And when you look at this verse, my husband recited it. I want to share a couple of things that just resonate with me. First, I find it fascinating. God's word, his timing, everything he does is purposeful, right? And he, in the second chapter of Genesis, talks about a man will leave his father and mother. Did Adam and Eve have a father and mother? Hmm. God, they walked with God. So that tells me God's word is as alive and true today and applies to us. And it sets the priority that after God, who comes first in my family? It's not the Cowboys. Unfortunately, it's not the Aggies, Pastor, or the Cowboys, Brad. Sorry. It is my mate, my partner, my husband. Yes. Secondly, right? This is referred to as a marriage covenant language. It is absolutely beautiful. And this comes before sin enters the world. Genesis 2.24. He designed marriage and it was perfect. So marriage is intended to be the closest thing on this earth right, that we have that when we do it right and we're God honoring, it is amazing. Amazing. And yes, there are seasons. So what does it mean to become one? What does that look like? You can see on the slide, there is a physical oneness. Yeah, baby. I cannot touch my God physically. Yeah, baby. <laughs> but I can be close and intimate with this man who loves me unconditionally. As I age 
and things sag and gravity takes over and things are in different places, people, I'm just saying, right? This man loves me unconditionally. Soul, that our souls, because we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, our spirits are one, we have God in our lives, and our souls are together to get through life. To become one. To become one. One. God's divine mathematics. Isn't that amazing? One plus one. If you said this in school, they'd kick you out. One plus one equals one. God's divine mathematics for marriage. Love it. Okay, so you've probably all seen this illustration. This is an illustration that God designs for marriage. And it, it's the triangle where the, the husband and the wife are at the bottom. And God is at the top of the triangle. And as we move up that triangle, indicating our desire to draw closer to God, look what happens to that distance between husband and wife, right? It becomes shorter. They become closer. So there's a direct relationship between the vertical and the horizontal. God's design for our marriage. Now, let me ask you all a question. As we have our personal relationships with our Lord, do you think we move up the triangle at the exact same time? No. No. Right? We have struggles, we have busyness, we go through things, and, and there are times in a season where my walk with my Lord was stagnant. Right? So what happens when we move up the triangle differently? We'll talk about that with the roles of the husband and wife. It's the, it's the hull to little, get you to come in two little weeks. Little fish hook but there. But the point is, as we are blessed to come alongside others in their marriage, and as they struggle... We focus on what is your personal relationship with your God? Where do you stand with God? Because as your personal relationship strengthens and you draw closer, your marriage will strengthen and draw closer. We have never had a couple come to us struggling in their marriage that was, that was also not struggling. At least one of them was not struggling in their relationship with God. And so that's where we always want to start. Where are you in your walk? And how can we help? And, and we, right? How and, can we help? And during that sermon, we talked about those three things. Are you praying together? Are you in God's word? How do you bless each other in their love language? All right. So what is a covenant? Go ahead. Next slide. So let's talk about, and I don't know if you can see, well, if you can see that, but I'm going to read that. To have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, uh, to love and to cherish till death do us part, um, forsaking all others according to God's holy ordinance. I can't even read. Um, anybody recognize that language? Anybody have that language read at their, their wedding? Right? That's very common to us. That, but look at the language. Is that contractual language? Have you ever read a contract that read like that? No, that's covenantal language. That's God-ordained language for our marriage. Unconditional language. That's, that's what a covenant is. So let's dig into that a little bit more. Because this is where you will see where secular thinking creeps into our marriage, even inside the walls of the church. So let's look at that first one. You have that handout, by the way. Yes, that handout should be in your hand. Yeah, in one of your handouts. And so let's let's go through that. Uh, co contract is all about obligation. I have to. Where covenant is, I want to. Big distinction there. I have to versus I want to. As you can see the next one, the contract is impersonal. It very much involves what I have to do, what, I, what you require of me. But when you look at a covenant, it is very personal. I'm all in. It is all about what I can give into the relationship. And then a contract is conditional. And this happens a lot in our marriages. If you do your part, I'll do mine. That's a contract. Look at what a covenant is. I'll do my part regardless of whether you do yours. That's amazing. Stark contrast. Okay. Leverage. Now, this, this happens with all of us. 
I will look out for my own best interest, right? What, what can I get out of this? That's the prenup That's right the there, folks. Yes. Whereas a covenant is about loyalty, right? You can read it. I am looking out for our, we are one. Team yes. us. Team us. I'm looking out for our best interests. Contract is about suspicion. I want assurances that you'll do your part. Contract, I mean, a covenant, I will certainly do my part. You can see the next one. Okay, so what's it going to take? That's the contract side. What's it going to take? And then in this, we know God is all about relationships. right? And this is no. What can I give? I am in it. Next one is a quiz question. Contract is all about compromise. I will meet you halfway. And we hear this all the time. A compromise is good in marriage. 50-50, right? That's marriage, 50-50. We've heard that since we were this high. Marriage is good. Compromise is good. Not if it's contractual in terms. Not if the thinking behind it is contractual. Look at what... Look what uh, Covenant is, I will give 100% regardless. That's covenant thinking. Contract is the compromise. So you're, you're, you're thinking, well, Rick, are you saying there should be no compromise in marriage? I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying the attitude behind the compromise should be selfless and sacrificial. That's a good, healthy compromise. When it starts becoming negotiation and and you do your part and I'll do mine, and it's contractual thinking, that's where compromise does not belong in a marriage. And it creeps in our marriage all the time. And then the last one we've already talked about, when you have a contract, it is very temporary, but with a covenant, it is permanent. Pretty, pretty stark contrast. Between Any questions, people. comments about that? Makes sense? Yes, please. Amen. Amen. That's a perfect, Please, yes, that's a great comment. Amen. Yes, Very yes, much. I want to. And you're right, sometimes we don't want to, but we ought to, and therefore we do it. We choose to. Yes, perfect. Excellent. Perfect comments. Thank you. Love it. All right, so where have we been here? Okay, so establishing a covenant foundation. So we talked about contract versus covenant. And are we thinking contractually in our marriage? And, and it just creeps in. The world bombards us with contractual thinking, and it, and it floods our marriage. This next one, candidly, I pray about this. I give it to my God. And my simple question is, where is God in your marriage? Do you invite him to be the center of it, right? And just as we have the privilege and opportunity to come before our Lord with communion, as Pastor reminds us, to seek Him and to reveal, that's hard to say, Lord, reveal to me my sin. I don't understand why it's so hard for me, but it is. And yet, when we do that, this is the same type of thing. Do you bring God into the center of your marriage? And then if you think about it, a covenant relationship leads to a greater sense of security and intimacy. The, hear me clearly here, folks. There is no out clause in a covenant marriage. If you have in the back of your mind an out clause, you are thinking contractually about your marriage. That is not God's design for marriage at all. It is a covenant marriage. In, in fact, Jesus was asked about marriage, and in Mark 10:9 he goes, um, uh, "What God has put together, let no man separate." Right? It is a covenant relationship. We go to we go to a church to get married, and we go to a court to get divorced. What's wrong with that picture? Right? We're not honoring God's covenant in marriage. So what we've tried to do in this time is set the foundation, right, 
of what God says about marriage. And from understanding foundation, from learning more and seeking it, then we can move into day-to-day -day struggles that we all face. So it is time for you all Interaction time. to talk and sit together. Here are the questions uh, that we have about. I don't know that, I don't think you have a handout with those on them. Yes. But yeah, go ahead and use these three questions at, for discussion at your table, especially number three. How does our marriage refine couples? How do those lessons make a better person? Um, oh no, how have you been viewing your marriage? Do you see any contractual thinking in your marriage? That's an important topic. Please discuss at your table. So we'll give you about 12 minutes to discuss and then we'll have a quick wrap up afterwards. Get you to jump out. That woke everybody up. Yeah. Hey, good discussions. I got, I got to walk around a little bit. Good discussions going. In fact, I can't even get you to stop discussing. Go ahead. Okay. Anybody want to share anything that resonated or stood out in your discussion? Any pearls of Any wisdom? Any pearls to share with our church family? Well, now that we said as it we that all way. come alongside, now there's silence. <laughs> That's right. No? Uh, no pearls of wisdom. Yes. yes. Please. That's okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, now, for the, for the world to hear. Uh, my, my husband, Melvin, I'm Connie. Melvin just shared his uh, first marriage, which ended in his spouse's death. He knows was a covenant marriage. Well, after about five years, he married, and that lasted 10 years into a divorce. And he definitely knows that. What? Contractual. Contractual. Was a contractual marriage? Uh, yes. But and Christians. Yeah. And changed their lives. Okay. But from that, the Lord led me to Connie and made did my life change. Amen. <laughs> All right. And our marriage is covenant. And my first marriage was covenant. It's so crazy. Uh, I mean, to see hindsight how God worked. Yes. Uh, the day I laid eyes on my first husband, I went home and told my roommate, I think I seen the man I'm going to marry someday, today. Yeah. I mean, when we met, we didn't speak, but just met in the hallway, I had that feeling. And several months later. Got we hitched. Were, yep. Thank you. Any other comments? Any other Observations. Any observations from our pastors? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we were talking about how selfishness is part of why marriage fails. And we just learned from the Bible that over the course of time, God had allowed us to get to know each other through marriage. The narrative that's been put in society yes. has been focused on selfishness. Yes. About how we want to win over the other. Yes. So, Yep. It's all about you, me, you. And the Lord just said, no, I want you to take the big hill that I put in front of you. And I want you to do that. And all of a sudden, we started pushing that selfishness. And that's exactly what we need to do in our marriage. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we talked about our theology is, not, is, is what's missing. Our mar marriage isn't bad. Our theology. Yeah, what Jason and I wanted to say is what Sue meant to say. Ah, <laughs> there it is. is. There it is. There it comes. Yeah, what Sue meant to say. What she meant to say. No, one of the things we talked about was just it's so helpful to have people uh, in your life that can see, can can speak into your marriage because we were talking about the fact that we we under we could answer these things correctly, right? If and but we can't always see the blind spots in our own. Live, so knowing knowing that we need people that can point out when even if the things we know we're not applying to our lives, so that was an important thing. The, yeah, oh, in your separate marriage. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying yeah. that, Robbie. Our pastors talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Robbie. Yes. Well, God, yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Points to y'all. So y'all, this is what church family is all about, right? Different generations coming together in times of joy and sorrow. And we are very thankful
that you are here. So as a summary and wrap up. Marriage is designed by God, a sacred covenant, not a contract. If you take away nothing else from tonight, take away that. It is a covenant, not a contract. You can see number two, there is the world view, and it is full of lies about marriage. And as the battle belongs to the Lord, how do we make a stand for God's truth by reflecting the light and love of Christ through our marriage, that the world may see God through us? One of the books uh, that I love, and we, done it, we did it in our growth group, was Gospel Fluency by Jeff Vanderstel. And, and that book just emphasized the need to understand God's word and to stand for that throughout our lives, in our marriage, in our relationships. So as you can see, we talked about this. Remember the triangle. Your relationship with your Lord and Savior coming to him is has a direct impact on this relationship right here. And then, yes. The last one is one of diligence. We need to be diligent in our marriage. And that's why we're glad you're here tonight. And that's what we would invite every growth group in this, in this church to, to offer at least, uh, you know, during the year, maybe a six-week block on marriage because it's so important that we work on our marriage. The other thing I want to say is remember humor and Sinbad. He had it right with this last marriage bullet. Marriage is work. If we can practice our homework, if we can work on our golf swing, if we can do things to better our skills and our family, are you willing to work on your marriage? And by being here, that's what you're doing. And I have a foot stomp about there is a marriage workshop class. Yes. Anybody, anybody know the importance of the dates? One, two, March. One and two, March. Put them on your calendar. Marriage workshop right here at First Baptist Church. Okay? You can sign up. There's, a, there's um, uh, car, uh, cards that have a little code that you can scan. It's on our website. Um. And I, we've been doing this for 14 years. This workshop is the best material. We've done family life. We've done focus on the family. We've done art of marriage. We've done all of those. This is the best workshop that we have personally been involved in. So I don't want to oversell it, but it is pretty, pretty amazing stuff. The last thing you see, one of the many resources that our church offers Right Now Media, this is one of the studies that is available on Right Now Media, we talked about it this evening, that gets to the foundations of a God-designed marriage, and that's Gary Thomas' Sacred Marriage, if you want to uh, look at a resource available to you. If you're a member of First Baptist Church, you have access to Right Now Media. That's right. There's a card in your notebook that gives that shows you how to do that.